Chapter 14 It was his last year at the university. As he learned how to open his heart to new things, his juniors had become classmates and friends who he hung out with after the class, either in a food shop or in a sports game, before he went home. As he was occupied with the classes and many activities with his friends, it helped him feel less lonely, as if he wasn't alone in the world. His life became more positive with the long path ahead of him. He flew to the U.S. to check some universities to continue his master's degree the past summer. Sometimes the life on the hill came back to his mind, but he wasn't as strong as before, as if the wound in his heart was finally healed. As for the matter of the heart, he didn't shut himself down and went out on dates with some girls, but didn't bother keeping in touch with neither of them. Then came the day when he received a card, and it gave him a wake-up call. That, even if time had made a face fade in his memory, but no one had ever taken the place of that someone. Thien looked at the light brown envelope in his hand that he received after coming home from school. The sender name even surprised him more. Captain Vassant, M.D. It was P. Doc Nam. He ripped the envelope open in a hurry and almost tore the card inside, a hard paper with large gold letters. You're invited to attend our wedding event. A wedding? The young man read the bride's name, the pediatrician in Bangkok, and read the date and location to memorize them. The organ in his left chest was thundering as he thought this might be the chance to see someone who'd been on his mind. On Friday night, the youngest son of the family headed back home in a high speed. After he got out of the car, he rushed in to give a peck on his mom's cheek and ran up the stairs towards his room. Lady Lalita was bewildered for a millisecond and she recalled that he was going to a wedding of a senior friend. She told the maids to bring him laundered suits for him to pick one. Thien shot out of the bathroom and saw his mom laying out a black-gray Armani suit and other brands on the bed. I think this one is nice and proper. You said he's an officer? There must be many high-ranking officers at the wedding. Whatever. Thien had no comment as he was drying his hair. You haven't told me how you got to know the groom. She didn't get a clear answer for him the first time she asked, as if he wanted to hide something. The almond eyes glanced at his mom in the mirror, weighing his options. Finally, he decided to give her more details. He's a field doctor at the operating base near the village I lived. That's how we became friends. He must have been a good friend to you. It's been a year and he still remembered to send you this card. He helped me a lot. The end didn't elaborate on what. I didn't imagine that he'd still think of me since it's been ages. The doctor even took the trouble to look for his home address. The mother didn't pry further. She picked a cream-colored shirt for the suits and folded a maroon handkerchief into a triangle shape to slide under the chest pocket. Looking at the lean, tall young man who looked impeccable in his attire, pride swelled up in her heart. I'll be going now, Mom. I don't want to get stuck in traffic. He took his mom into a loose embrace to thank her for her help. Then he hurried down to the car that had been polished and spotless. Communing in the evening of Bangkok took longer than he'd imagined. He was stuck in intersections for nearly an hour, and once he looked at the watch, he got even more pissed that the reception had already started. As soon as the traffic lights turned green, he stomped on the accelerator with his high-end suede shoes. The reception was held at a hotel in Panakon district near the Grand Palace in the middle of the old town. Hence the decor was a bit vintage, which he thought was awesome. He parked the car in front of the hotel. 
As he walked through the lobby, he saw the ladies in silk gowns chatting among themselves, and their diamond sets were sparkling in the light so they could blind someone. The classic tune could be heard from the ballroom in the far end. The wedding arc at the entrance was decorated with white and blue flowers, creating a dome on the top. The bride and the groom, who were both medical doctors, were dressed in simple yet elegant gowns, befitting their status. The lean form in a grey suit stood still among the other guests. The young man's hair was combed up to reveal his handsome face, and he looked like he'd just walked out of a fashion magazine. So attractive, people had to stop and look. Dr. Vassant looked up, was taken aback and a grin split across his face. He excused himself from the senior guest, not caring if he'd offended them or not. The picture of the groom lurking towards and taking the younger man into a big hug made everyone stop in their tracks, looking. Was that a third wheel in the relationship? A photographer who reacted first pressed repeatedly on the shutter in case the picture could sell. Bro, I didn't think you'd come. Pidok Nam, let me go. People are looking. The end grimaced as if he'd swallowed a bitter pill as all eyes were on them. The military doctor chuckled and let the younger man go. He raked his eyes on Thien from head to toe, saying jokingly, You look even more handsome than the last time we saw each other. My friend's got a good eye. Even if it was merely a tease, Thien felt overwhelmed. His light brown eyes shook, his thin lips pressed tight as if he was holding back his emotions. Vasant saw the sudden change in the younger man's demeanor and let out a long sigh. You came here today because you wanted to see him, didn't you? Even if the younger man didn't say a word, the doctor knew what the answer was. He slowly shook his head. He came to my engagement ceremony when we did the water blessing at noon. He just left for Chang'ai this afternoon. Thien closed his eyes, feeling as if he turned into a stone, not knowing what to do when the other man acted as if he'd forgotten about everything that happened between them. Was it because he knew I was coming tonight? His voice was barely a croaking whisper. Vasant was taken back. He grabbed the former volunteer teacher's shoulder and made an excuse for his friend. If he knew you're still thinking of him until now, he'd be happy. The younger man took in a deep breath before forcing a smile to the man who was trying his best to cheer him up. He'd be happy, but not enough to see me. You don't have to make an excuse for him. It sucks. The doctor scratched his neck, hearing the comeback. Then his wife-to-be jumped in for the rescue. Is there something wrong? No. Nothing. We're just talking. Thien answered because the bride was eyeing at them as to why they were having a long chat. Now, excuse me, I'll go inside. Congratulations to both of you. Wait, Thien. Can I have your phone number? Dr. Vassan called after the younger man and took a piece of paper and a pen at the reception desk at the entrance. Thien gave his number without a second thought. There was no signal on the hills anyway, so he didn't have to be worried of someone reaching out for him. The groom then was dragged away by his bride to welcome the incoming guests at the flower arc, as the former volunteer teacher was grinning, watching how the cunning doctor got tamed by his wife. Eight o'clock in the evening was the hour the bride and the groom would continue their ceremony in the hall. Elegant cadets in white uniforms marched in and lined up in the middle, pulling their swords from the waists in unison to create an holy arc. The spotlight shone down at the couples who were walking side by side under the arc, looking just like a dream. Tian held his glass of orange juice, feeling his breath caught. He had never seen Captain Fufa in his formal uniform. What he saw was the man in his field gears or the greenish khaki t-shirt with a scowl as if he constantly had constipation. 
He pictured the man in his mind, how he would look like in a spotless uniform. He was tall with broad shoulders and long legs. He must have looked so good and turned heads of many women. Unfortunately, that he didn't like women. Tian snorted. But the smile was short-lived, as his lips stretched into a thin line. The more he thought about the man, the memories rushed back in and were as clear as crystal, as if they just happened yesterday. He shifted, feeling uncomfortable, and raised the glass to salute the couple as the spokesperson announced, before drinking the juice in one go. He put the empty glass on the counter and pushed through the crowd to leave. He didn't go for his car, but chose to amble aimlessly along the footpath in front of the hotel. A large fortress that had once protected the capital city could be found in Santik Chakprakan Park. The massive ruin still commanded awe with the lights that were directed at it and pulled an absent-minded man towards it. Some locals and tourists were staring at the lean man who was pulling down his tie with an expensive suit in one hand, looking peculiar. He looked listless, crestfallen as he walked towards the Chao Phraya River at the back of the park. They were hoping he wouldn't jump to kill himself. Thien dropped himself down on a long bench facing the main river in the heart of Bangkok, feeling mentally and emotionally depleted. The cool breeze from the water touched his face, giving him a little refreshment. He inhaled, taking in the fresh air, and let his eyes wander to the bridge on the right-hand side, not too far away. His hand dropped to his side, touching a hard paper. It must have been a leaflet that promoted tourist attractions around Bangkok that someone had left behind. Thien picked it up and looked absent-mindedly at it, until his eyes caught a college photo. Two demons that were influenced by Rama Kien stood guard at the entrance of Wat Aron Vihara. It reminded him about someone who had often teased for resembling such a demon with the tail, imposing figure and a deep skull on his face. The wall that he had built up to fool other people that he was strong started to crumble. He crushed the paper and dropped it to the ground, then lifted his hands to cover his face. His shoulders were shaking from the pain he thought he had closed up. But in fact, he was splitting open once again. You know, I have to go very far away for many years. Thien whispered to the wind, hoping it might carry his words to the cruel man who lived so far away and out of reach. Only if you told me you still miss me. Perhaps our parallel paths could come closer. The final exam of the last academic year came to an end. His classmates were excited that they were filing for graduation and to attend ceremony in the next few months. For Thien, he had something else to do. The American university he had applied to with his English score had sent an acceptance letter with the condition that he had to take a semester of the English preparation class before starting his master's degree. The young man was picking up his clothes that he'd be taking with him on the journey, and his mom was helping him with sorting them out and handling them to the maid who was folding the clothes to put into the luggage. You should take a thick sweater with you, dear. It's summer now, mom. It will make the luggage too heavy. I'll buy one when I get there. He was a man and preferred to travel light. Let's take one or two. It's going to be autumn soon, and you will have one at hand when you need it. Thien shrugged, letting his mom have her way. The phone suddenly rang up. The screen showed Dr. Nam's name, who came to Bangkok once in a while and took the chance to call him. Once he asked about the colossal officer, the doctor dodged the conversation with a vague answer like, He's fine, don't worry. The young man looked at his mom, who was busy with his luggage, and left the room so he could talk in private. 
So Lady Lolita had to take the clothes out of the closet and her eyes landed on a backpack that was pushed in the deepest corner. She saw a shirt with a peculiar embroidery at the hemp peeking out from the bag, so she took the liberty to open it up to check. What she found was a hill tribe hand woven shirt and then found a few more as she pulled the first one out. She couldn't believe her eyes that her high-end son would wear this type of costumes. As she was picking them up in the bag, she spotted a pastel-colored diary at the bottom of the backpack. She had a suspicion that he might have met some sweet girls, so she picked up the diary to quench her curiosity. The cover was decorated with paper mache letters saying, A Tale of a Thousand Stars. It obviously belonged to a girl. Flipping the first page, her heart nearly stopped. The name Miss Thorfinn that appeared on the page was an unforgettable name. Two years ago, her husband and her reached out to the girl's family to repay her with money to show their gratitude. She was the one who truly owned that heart. Lady Lelita learned from what she had. People investigate for her that Thorfinn had been a volunteer teacher on one of the northernmost hills, and then her son ran away to become one as well. She once thought that it was a coincidence, an incredible happenstance. But the evidence in her hand made her realize that she had been wrong all along. Everything happens for a reason. The mother wanted to call her son in and make him talk, but a corner of her mind reminded her that if she made him upset, he might have run away again, back to the hill, to the perilous borderland. How could she bear, as a mother, if one day she'd get a phone call telling her that he was injured and hospitalized, like that day? The plump lady dropped on the soft mattress, feeling resigned. She was getting older each day. Her eldest son was a high-ranking officer with a bright future ahead of him in England. His wife was very pregnant, and they were expecting a child. Her middle child daughter was able to take care of herself despite the divorces under her belt. The one she was worried for the most was her youngest son. He was ten years apart from their first two children, and that was why she had been pampering him. It was also his critical myocarditis that made her tenfold worried, despite his miraculous survival. Yet, the way he was running away from home made her realize that parents were the ones who gave life, but it was the child's right to write his own destiny. Still, she wanted to see her son walk down the path she thought was right and good for him. Her chubby hand closed the diary, knowing there was no need to bring up the past. Let bygone be bygone, and she would not speak of it again. As she was putting the diary in the backpack, a photo fell out. It was the silhouette of a man. It was dark, but she could still tell from the uniform that he belonged to a border patrol unit. The immaculate eyebrows frowned. Perhaps he was Thorfinn's beloved, since she was carrying his picture in her diary. But the more she thought, the more curious she got. Did her son meet this man on the hill? Dien was talking on the phone to his friend in a distant land on the balcony on the second floor of the house. He told the doctor his tribal itinerary as he was leaving to further his study in another country, hoping Vassant would relay the message to that someone. But as he asked how the captain was doing, what he got was a chuckle and the same answer. He's fine, don't worry about him. He's trying his own way. What was that supposed to mean? As he hung up and got back inside, he came upon his father. Where's mom? The former general asked. His wife said she was going to help the boy, but the boy was here instead. Tien pointed his thumb over his shoulder. In my room, she's packing for me. 
she's more thrilled than the one who's traveling. She's just happy that her youngling got into a famous university. She will be bragging about it at the next charity reception. The general chuckled with a good humor, but his son was frowning. You two look way happy, as if you don't want me here. The father was quiet for a brief moment. Then he said, You have a minute? Let's talk in my office. Tian cocked an eyebrow in surprise. He had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with his father once after he had come down the mountains, which made him realize how much he was loved. Even if the man didn't shower love, affection on him openly, Due to being a soldier, he was used to giving commands, but his dad turned out to be the one who understood and respected his decision the most. The younger man nodded and followed his father to the office at the end of the right wing. He sat down in a chair on the other side of the wooden desk and watched how the former general bent down to unlock a shelf. The general soon came up again with a big pile of envelopes. What's this, dad? He picked up a few envelopes to open and came to a halt. They're from Seng Tong Foundation. Your mother doesn't want you to think about that place ever again. So she told the maids to throw them away. If I saw one, I took it back. But they might not be all. Tian stared at the letters where his little pupils had drawn pictures to him with messages like We miss you, Picrayon, and When are you coming back to us? What touched him most was the letter from Aji, the Akka boy who still drew the same picture with a happy family holding hands. But this time, the figure that was there instead of Thorfinn was him. Seeing how his youngest son was looking at the letter as if they were precious, the general's face softened. Don't be upset with mom. You know she only wants the best for you. They haven't forgotten me till now. The eyes that looked at his father were reddened. But even if there were nothing but good memories there, I'm not going back just because of these letters. The words filled with hurt made the father stop and think. Suddenly he leaned forward a little and said in a firm voice, Are you happy? It was a short and straightforward question, but it shook his heart. The thin lips pressed tight and trembled, trying to hold back a turmoil that was pushing against the thick wall he had built up inside. I don't want to make you and mom sad again. That's not an answer. Dad, I don't know. He dropped his head on the pile of letters, played with confusion. Please don't ask me anything. Hearing the words, the general rose and walked to stand at his son's side, putting his hand on the back of the boy's head. I don't know what's going on in your mind, but remember this. Whatever you choose for yourself in this future, I'm here for you always. He stepped out of the room afterwards, leaving the younger man to himself in the office. Tian knew that he wasn't feverish with the desire to become a volunteer teacher at Fa Pandao again, but with the promise he'd given to someone. He had to be a fool to believe that an unshakable feeling could merge their paths one day. Yet that one day seemed so out of reach. The young man slowly and tiredly gathered the open letters together. What a torment. Time flew. The week earlier, Tien was climbing a cliff in a gym with his classmates during the daytime, strolled through a new shopping mall in the evening, and had a dinner with Tal. And today was the day he was leaving to further his study of Rousseau's. He picked Thorfinn's diary up. She was the woman who had given him a second life, and he put her book into his backpack to be a reminder of a good memory he once had. The lean form tightened a red jacket and pulled a large luggage with a smaller handheld one out of the bedroom. His parents were waiting for him in a van to drive him to the airport. The servants lifted the luggage into the back of the car and closed the door. 
As the car headed away from the mansion, Tian lowered his head into silence. Longing and sadness dwelled up in his chest, which felt like it was bursting. It's all right, honey. Once you're there, you'll be having a good time. You won't even miss home. The mother raised her hand to caress his arm in comfort, seeing how dejected he looked. Thin lips lifted into a dry smile, but he remained quiet until they reached the destination. The airport was already busy in the late morning with tourists and travelers from all over the world. The European van parked right at the departure gate and the driver rushed to carry the baggage as the employers and their sons stepped out of the vehicle. Thien pushed his trolley with baggage towards the check-in special lane for business and first-class passengers. As he got the seats and already had his bags loaded, he took his backpack and his small carry-on with wheels back to where his parents were waiting. There were two other men who had been like a family with him there. Hello, Uncle Pithan. The youngest son by the former right hand man of his father and turned to the other. Hey, Pite. Surprised to see you here. I'm here to say farewell. I traded my shift especially for this. You didn't have to bother. He even told Tall and his classmates they didn't have to come to the airport. I had to. You will be away for years. My ears will be lonely that no one will be calling me to whine about study. The man who recently became a doctor smiled, thinking about how the younger man liked to call him late at night and moan about his exams. The calls are cheap in America. You think you'll get away from this? Whatever you want, spoiled brat. I'm on 24-7 standby just for you. Finishing his sentence, he remembered that he had prepared a special gift for his brother from another mother and pulled out a picture frame. I'm sorry it took two years. My phone was dead and I lost all the pics. Then I remember that I uploaded them to an external flash drive. Thien received the gift, bewildered. But as he looked at the pictures, tears welled up in his eyes. It wasn't just a picture frame, but a digital one with changing images uploaded into the frame. The picture that was on the screen was the one in which he had been coming down the hill with the villagers and the children coming to say goodbye. Love and friendship emanated from the little rectangular frame that held many more photos from his life on the hill. It was so palpable even when time had passed. The almond eyes searched for a figure among the ones on the screen, but what they found was nothing. Taichin smiled lightly, tapping the thin shoulder of the younger man. Let it remind you of better days when you feel down. Lady Lilita saw the way her son was clutching the frame to his chest, the frame with the pictures from his days in the village on the hills, so she uttered a warning. Don't dally, it's almost boarding time, dear. Tian took in a deep breath and wiped the snot from the tips of his nostrils. He walked with his family to the baggage security check area. You guys don't have to go in there. I'll call you as soon as I land. Tian gave everyone an embrace for coming to see him off. He pulled his luggage and walked away from them before turning to give them the last look. His mom, dad, Uncle Pithen, and Pite were waving at him from the spot. But his eyes wandered past them to someone who was far, far away. I am leaving now, you know? As he showed the passport and the plane ticket to the security, his phone that he didn't turn off rang, stopping him in his track. He shouldn't have been paying attention to it, for he had to board the plane, but he fetched the phone from his trousers. The screen showed a number that wasn't recorded, but he pressed the green button still. Hello? There was no word from the other end, only static voice as if the signal was bad. The end frowned thinking the other end must have dialed the wrong number. But before he pulled away the phone, a voice spoke up. The end. Deep, firm voice made his world, the world that spun fine on its own so far, shatter 
and things stood still. He froze, stunned, and it was moments before he forced his petrified lips to part. Captain. Lady Lolita was the first one who spot the sudden shift in her son, so she walked up to him, followed by the others. When they got to where he was, no one dared speak a word. The fair face was emotionless, but tears were streaming down his eyes. He pressed the phone tight to his ear as if waiting for the most crucial moment in his life. I wish you good luck. The voice on the other end spoke bland words, but that was enough to shatter the end's wall of strength. He had tried his best to build. Two years. It's been two years, and that's all you had for me? Thien's voice was broken as his chest was bursting with overwhelming emotions. The officer was silent for a long moment. Then he spoke what he had pushed back at the furthest corner of his heart. I miss you. It was as if he was whispering right by his ear. The last bolt had been pushed out making the young man break into a loud sob as tears poured out of his eyes and all pent-up feelings exploded. The longing, the sadness, and love. Nothing else mattered at this moment. All I ask is that you're still waiting for me. The sobbing young man made heads turn with curiosity, but the end didn't pay them any mind. He tried to talk through tears as the line had been cut. Captain, wait for me, right there. The mother walked in to embrace her son, not knowing what to do. She had no idea who was on the call. All she knew, that he had affected her son to an unfathomable length. Don't cry, my boy. Tell me what's going on. Mom, I'm sorry. The abrupt apology made Lady Lalita go silent. Her maternal instinct prompted her to change the question. Who's captain? It seemed like Thien didn't hear her words as his mind zeroed on in what he had to do next. He turned to his father and spluttered with the voice of a man who had come to term with his decision. Dad, I can't leave. The general stared into his son's swollen eyes that shone with determination. He let out a long sigh, not knowing if it was from a relief or even more of worries. Go and resolve the issue, then we'll talk. The former general issued an order, as if the younger man was his subordinate. You're a man. Do not think back and regret this. Understood? The final word that reminded Thien of the tall officer on the hill made him laugh. He wiped his tears from his cheeks and saluted his father the way a soldier's son should. Yes, sir. He turned toward his lady, mom, who was still in shock, reaching out to put his hands over hers and squeezing them. I'm sorry, I'm letting you down. I love you the most, mom. Lalita's mouth fell open as she wanted to call her son who was running away with his luggage, but it was too late. She whipped to her husband who had given the boy the permission to go. What's going on? Our son just changed his destination. The general answered slowly, but his voice was so firm that his wife's face reddened with anger. You mean back to that hill? No. I'm not going to let him go. I've done all I could to pull him away from that place, but you were the one who pushed him away again. I don't care. I'm going to drag him back here. She turned around to leave, but Colonel Pithan, who had gotten a silent command from his superintendent, lunged in her way. Please calm down, my lady. Everyone's looking. I think it's better discussed at home. Tian will be in Chiang Rai by that time. Seeing no one move an inch, as she had commanded, Lady Lolita balled her hands as tears rolled down her face. Why is everyone making me feel like I am the bad one here? Her husband stepped in and wound his arms around her shoulders to comfort her. 
No one is blaming you for anything, my love. I just love him. I want the best for my son. She pushed her face against her husband's shoulder, sobbing, but she let him take her back to the van in front of the departure building. The general opened the door for his wife and went in after her. Then he smiled and said a sentence that made her stubbornness vanish. Your son has been given a second chance, a second life. Let him live it how he sees fit. A miracle happens only once in a lifetime, you know? Lady Lolita pressed her lips tight, still feeling upset. But she was swayed by his words. She had been trying to hold things in place as best as she could, and obviously her youngest son took after her on this aspect. It seems it was time for her to accept it. All right. But I hope someday he will realize that I only want the best for him. She couldn't help her sarcastic remark, even if she knew she had to get over it. Colonel Pithan and his son took the responsibility of cancelling the plane tickets and reclaiming the luggage, so they were heading home. On the road, Lady Lolita asked out of the blue about something that had been on her mind. Do you know the one our son referred to as Captain? Must be the man who was given the duty to look after him on the hill. But then he called. Our son just burst into tears and threw his study right away. At the end of her words, both parents fell into silence. Then it was the lady who reacted first, and she screamed at the top of her lungs, Oh my god! I want to pass out! Even if he was on the plane on its way to Shanghai for just over an hour, his heart had already jumped there long ago. As he gazed at the white clouds out the window, his mind was played with worries and scenarios. He was feeling guilty. How had he made up his mind like this? But on the other hand, he was feeling relieved that at least he had completed his bachelor degree as they had wished him to. And when he got there, would the villagers still welcome him with open arms like they once did? It had been over two years. Thien pushed his head against the window until the minus temperature outside crept into his skin. His eyes that were swollen from crying were closing to rest his tired mind hoping no one had filmed how he was wailing like a young kid in public. That would have been a total humiliation if it got published on the internet. And this was all because of you, the giant officer. He had imagined various punishments he could do to the captain, yet his lips lifted up into a content smile. In a few hours, their paths would merge once again. Shanghai Airport was still busy in the late afternoon, with many people waiting for their loved ones. The city boy who was carrying only his backpack and the wheeled small luggage walked in the heat to find a rental car to go onto the hill. It took him a while to negotiate the price and finally found himself a truck that would take him there. Why are you going up there, bro? It's quite far away and there's no electricity. The driver asked as he took the car along the winding road on the mountain slope. I'm visiting a friend, he said briskly, but the curious eyes were raking over him from top to toes. Even a countryman could tell that this young man came from an affluent life. How on earth did he have a friend on such a place? I was a volunteer teacher here. As he elaborated further, the driver made a face as if he was looking at a character dressed in a brand name costume, walking in the middle of a field. So Thien gave up trying to explain and looked out the window instead. It was two hours that the old truck finally reached a small intersection. An old post of the Department of Highways pointed to the direction towards Fa Pandao. Thien lifted his bag down and paid the fee to the driver. The car soon drove off on the road, leaving the city boy alone in the middle of the road. The narrow dirt road that was cleared up to be a road into the village was still as rough as he'd once remembered. Yet he wasn't frail like he once had been two years ago, 
and he was carrying his trolley bag and stepping over the pits to hike uphill with these. The evening in Fa Pandao went on as it always did. Kama Bing Lei took off his woven hat and dusted himself off against his pants, sending the dirt up in the air. He had just returned from the tea plantation. A middleman came today so he had to be there to help the villagers from being cheated. Since the day the reckless volunteer teacher had been there, the villagers and the children learned to count, and that had helped him immensely. He let out a heavy sigh, feeling nostalgic. It had been ages. He wondered how Thien was doing. Perhaps the younger man had graduated and found a good job. A heavy thud on the ground in the bag made him turn around. His slanted eyes widened with shock. Was he dreaming? Kruthian? The city boy in front of him looked as good as he had remembered. No, he looked better, more healthier, not ashen and scrawny as he had once been. The lean, tall man raised his hand to perform a neat Y, but it was Bing Lei who abandoned all the formality and grabbed him into a tight hug. How come? Why? What are you doing here? The end smiled sheepishly, scratching the back of his neck. It was a hasty decision, so I didn't have time to tell everyone in advance. I was thinking perhaps I could dare ask you for a place to sleep overnight. Kama Bing Lei burst out laughing and slapped the long arm, smiling. You can stay here forever. Me and the village are here to welcome you, always. The man from the city far, far away smiled gently. This was it, the tight bond of friendship that fulfilled one's heart. But the volunteer teacher's hut is still unoccupied. Since the previous teacher left two months ago, it's been empty ever since. I'm not here as a teacher. Can I stay there? He asked, not wanting to make any troubles. But perhaps staying at someone else's home would be a bigger trouble. You stay there. The day after tomorrow, I'm going downtown for a meeting. I'll call the foundation to make an arrangement for you. Then did another vow to thank the older man from the bottom of his heart. Then the village master walked him to the hut at the back of the village that was deserted. Since no one knew a new volunteer teacher would come, the tiny hut was left in desolate condition. Luckily, the mosquito net and the mattress were still intact for use. Thien looked around the room where he laid and listened to the crickets at night as emotions welled up in his chest. Despite not having electricity, no TV and internet, and all the commodities, many precious memories were created here. You settle in there. I'll take the necessities for you. Bian Lei shouted from the crumbling bamboo stairs. Tian looked out the window and shouted back that he had heard the older man and came back to take care of the sleeping space. He took the mattress out to dust and put in the air on the balcony where the sun gently touched. He rummaged through the clothes that the maid had put in the small luggage. All he got was three, four pairs of shirts and pants and a new unopened boxer pack. Oh well, he could wash and rotate them. He didn't want the man who had taught him how to hand wash the clothes to be sad. The city boy chuckled to himself. He longed to run to the operating base right now to meet the special someone, but he must hold back. He was right here, after all, and sooner or later they would see each other again. All of a sudden, a chill ran down his spine as something came up at him. How could the captain call him when there was no phone signal on this hill? Or did he go downtown to make the call? It didn't seem possible. Or perhaps he had transferred to another base. Thien shook his head to shed the negative thought. Deep in his heart, he was certain that the other man had kept his word as well, just as they had promised to each other. He pulled the backpack to look if he still had anything else left in there, and his eyes landed on the pastel diary. This is one thing I have to finish. Thien pulled the diary that had turned his life upside down out, and took it with him as he walked out the hut. 
the evening sun from the ridge cast its orange light across the horizon. The cool breeze from the verdant thick forest brushed gently over him. The stranger who was walking through the tea plantation and went further. The rich thicket of trees soothed his anxious heart, washing away the worries he'd imagined the moment earlier. The end went up along the high slope that was the village namesake, familiar with this path well, until he stopped at a vast open yard where he had once been fooled with a make-up story. The young man chuckled softly to himself. At least he had counted to 999 stars. The lean form looked for a branch, and he crouched down to dig the soil with it near the edge of the cliff. He worked hard until he got quite a deep pit and flipped open the diary to the last page. The missing letters that would never be written again by her. He pulled out a pen from his pocket and started writing his own words. Thank you for giving me a new life. The heart in his left chest started thrumming all of the sudden, as if to give him a silent answer. Tien gently put the pastel diary into the pit. Sleep tight, Thorfinn. He scooped the soil to cover the diary, not caring if his hands would be dirty. He suddenly saw a big shadow that was shielding the sun at the horizon and a pair of shiny shoes that were stained with soil appeared before his face. His eyes raked up to the trousers that covered long, solid legs until they stopped on the intense face with a deep scowl, looking more severe than guardian demons. I knew you'd come. The deep, low voice sounded almost like a growl, but as the officer saw the stunned expression on the man who was kneeling below him, his heart softened. Thien, who was holding his breath, jumped up. His brown eyes widened as he stared at the tall man in the green khaki military uniform, with the emblems and insignias on the labels, along with the army ribbon on his chest. The only thing that was missing was his army cap. Since he was a little child, he'd seen many subordinates of his father in this type of uniform, coming in and out of their house as a regular sight but he'd never seen anyone as solid and graceful as this man. His poor, poor heart was beating, thud, thud, faster and faster, as if it was falling in love again. Fufa, who was running straight from the village up to the hill, sighed heavily, both relieved and frustrated with the younger man's reckless behavior. As he had been calling Thien, he was at the king... Mangai, the great camp in downtown Chang'ai, for an important ceremony. As soon as he heard the loud sobbing, as if the world was falling apart before the line was cut, he became so restless. He had to excuse himself from the evening reception, which was an improper behavior towards his superintendents, and left for the village right away. Why are you always in trouble? The magic of the moment evaporated as soon as the reprimand came from the captain. The spoiled man glared at the older man angry. I thought you would be happy to see me. I'm happy, but you shouldn't have ruined your life like this. This is the future I've chosen for myself. I choose to come back for you. Even if he was the target of the angry shout, but Fufa was still not hearing any words except the last one that shot right through his heart. His glare softened as he looked at the younger man with all the welled-up emotions. I could wait for years, no matter how long it takes. The words were like a cooling breeze that washed away the heated moment. Thien smiled lightly and shook his head. But I couldn't. He couldn't bear the long wait without seeing any hope. The officer inhaled deeply, then looked up at the darkening sky that the sun was vanishing. I guess you have found the last star. It was as if his past failed attempt was brought up to remind him how weak he was, and his expression became melancholic. If he had, he wouldn't have to wait this long. As he was deep in his pensive mood, 
the one who was looking up at the stars spoke in a gentle voice. But I found it. Fufa took his eyes from the sky and picked out an insignia from his shoulder. It was a pentacle under a glistening gold crown that the captain was putting on the soiled hand. He stepped closer and whispered at the tip of Thien's ear. Make a wish, now. The weight of the star was so colossal that Thien's body was trembling. Tears welled up in his eyes and slowly ran down his face. I wish that we will never be apart again. We will never be apart ever again. The officer repeated the wish, and he was ready to be the one who made this wish come true. The smile on the dark, handsome face was so gentle it hurt. Thien lunged and wrapped his arm tightly around the stern captain. The wait was over. He rested his head on a thick shoulder that bore no rank since the captain had taken it out and given it to him. Even if I did leave overseas and would never come back, would you really be waiting for me? Fufa wound his arms around his beloved, saying, No matter how long it took, have you ever thought about chasing after me? The sulking words made the captain silent for a moment. The intense eyes dropped to hide the sadness. The end. We can't always make things happen as fast as we want them to, but I've tried my best. To make the distance between us become less. I've tried my best. That was a sentence he'd always heard from Dr. Nam every time the man called him. He had always wondered what it meant. Or perhaps. The pentacle's pointy tips in his hand made him stunned. He remembered the time in high school, how his older brother, who just earned the major rank, complained he had to break his back studying to enter the command and general staff college so he could further his education and build on his career. The college was situated in Bangkok. The sense that he was being loved swelled up in his chest. He pushed his face in the captain's solid neck and let his happy tear fall until the green khaki labels became wet. He loved the scent of sunshine on this man, and every time they were close, he always felt safe and secure. Don't ever let me go again, no matter what. Fufa planted a possessive kiss on one smooth temple, tightening his arm around the lean man as a yes. When the star had fallen into the arms of the land that was underneath it, how could he ever let him go then?